Hi. Hello, how are you? Are you part of this expedition? Say that again. Are you excited? Are you excited? Yes, very excited. Actually, uh, my crew just completed our final exams this past week, and so it's it's very nice to have a lot of that work behind us. And we're actually in our rest week right now, uh, where we're spending time with our families and just taking advantage of relaxing a little bit before we head down to the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and prepare for the final phases of launch. That's amazing. How That's you amazing. became an astronaut? How became an astronaut? Tell me about yourself. Well, it's kind of a long road. I think people, it's very interesting. When you look at the astronaut office, we have everything from physicians like myself to engineers, test pilots, chemists. Uh, and so for myself, I initially started off in engineering at the George Washington University and then went to medical school after that. I, and I wasn't quite sure at the time how I would eventually work for NASA, but then I discovered uh, a certain program uh, called aerospace medicine that was offered in the state of Texas and decided to train there. And that is initially how I got my foot in the door into working for NASA. And so I initially started working for NASA as a flight surgeon. And a flight surgeon is really any physician that looks after and takes care of astronauts and their families. Um, also does a lot of other things for the agency, but that's how I started off and then decided to apply for the astronaut corps and was honored enough to get in in 2009. If, if you were to ask that same question of any of my fellow astronauts in my class, all of our stories would be different. It's actually pretty interesting. Serena, your father must be proud of, your, of uh, this history that you have as, as an astronaut. Yes, my father's definitely very proud. My whole family is proud. Um, my parents will be in Houston in Mission Control watching the launch. Uh, from Baikonur and the rest of my family will be out there with me on the steps of Kazakhstan watching the rocket launch. But tell me about the process to prepare for this flight. You have to take classes and exams? Yeah, so essentially once you come into the office as an, an astronaut, a new astronaut, you're, you're called an astronaut candidate and you undergo about two years of training, uh, basic space flight training and everything from space station systems like the electrical power system or environmental control system to robotics and even how to conduct spacewalks. And then once that initial astronaut candidate training is done and you are deemed um, eligible to be assigned to a space flight, at that point you get to wait your turn in line. And then one of those lucky days you get called into the chief's office and he says, I have a flight for you. Uh, and some people think we fly that next week, but that's not how it happens. Another very long training period starts off, and we do spend a lot of time here in Russia, in Star City, Russia, where we train to fly on the Soyuz vehicle. That is the vehicle that takes us to the International Space Station. And we spend probably anywhere from two to two and a half years training for that particular mission because there's very specific science experiments that we'll be performing, and then we work together with the other two members of our crew inside the Soyuz vehicle to make sure we get to and from the ISS safely. Serena, yo sé que tu padre es español, es, 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 habla español, es cubano y tú hablas un poquito de español. ¿Te sientes cubana en alguna forma y cuál es tu co comida favorita cubana? So, well, what I will say, so my, my Russian is actually a lot better than my Spanish, but I think what you asked me is what sort of food I like to eat, the Cuban sort of food. And, and certainly in my family, we have prepared a lot of those dishes, including frijoles negros and things like that, and, and certainly something we enjoy every holiday season. And do you feel Cuban in some way? Say that again? You feel Cuban in some way? You feel that you are Cuban, part Cuban? So, so I feel that I'm an American, and certainly any American in my position is absolutely proud and honored uh, to go to the space station and, you know, something my father and, my, and I and my whole family have talked about. So I am absolutely honored to have this opportunity to fly with this crew. Uh, proud to represent America, 100%. Hi, Serena. We're excited to talk to you again from Colorado. Hi, Denver. How are you? 
We've been following you on Twitter, and we noticed that you've been doing a lot of training over the last couple of months. Can you talk about some of the different things you've been doing in Star City? Absolutely. So this last trip in Star City, which is kind of our final trip before we prepare for launch, um, we take a series of final exams, and it's all the preparation we've been doing leads up to this. And last week on Thursday and Friday, uh, we completed those sets of exams. One day was an exam on the Russian segment of the International Space Station, where we execute specific tasks as a, as a crew. And then the second day, a much longer day, is our final exam on the Soyuz vehicle. And that is the vehicle that takes us to and from the space station safely. And so our crew of three, myself, uh, Alex Gers from Germany, and Sergei Prokopiev, uh, our Russian cosmonaut commander of the Soyuz, we work together as a team. Uh, we get inside the vehicle in our suits, and then they start throwing all the malfunctions at us to make sure that we can handle everything well as a crew. So it's a very long day uh, with many people watching, but it was a very successful day as we were able to prove that as a crew, we are ready to head down to Baikonur and prepare for launch. Speaking as a crew with a German, a Russian, an American, what language do you use? So inside the Soyuz vehicle, we speak in Russian. Uh, you know, the Soyuz is a Russian vehicle. All of our flight data files, everything is in Russian. And so, you know, it's an effort for everybody. Both Alex and myself learned to speak Russian. Sergey learns to speak English, though, as well. So it's interesting. When you see the three of us together, we'll go back and forth in English and in Russian. So sometimes Sergey will speak to me in English, and I will answer him in Russian. Uh, but inside the Soyuz vehicle, uh, Russian is the language. And, of course, when we're in contact with the Russian mission control or the Russian soup, they are speaking to us in Russian as well. And how is your Russian? It's not bad. Uh, I'm very good. What I tell folks is I'm very good with technical Russian. So anything pertaining to the vehicle itself, talking about engines, uh, ascent, inserting into orbit, anything like that, I'm actually pretty good at. Um, it's, it's, and it's funny, when you speak with astronauts, they say the harder types of Russian for them to speak is the more colloquial and just having a, a basic conversation with your crewmates about their families or things that they like to do. And so as a crew, we actually make a lot of extra effort to get together and do that because our families are so important to us. And so it's in, in that sense, it's a lot of fun because, again, we will go back in, in Russian and in English. What has surprised you the most during the training? Surprised me during the most during the training. Um, I think it's not really a surprise, but uh, a lot of my crewmates have mentioned this in the sense that we take folks from all different backgrounds. So myself, I'm a physician and a flight surgeon. Um, Alex is a volcanologist. Sergey Prokopiev is a test pilot. We take folks from tremendously different backgrounds, and we train them all operationally in the same manner so that we can perform the same way and execute the mission. And you really feel like you're in sync. And so when you look at the the difficulty, the training difficulty in doing that with not only folks from different nations, um, but also everybody, different languages, learning about a vehicle so that we all execute the mission in the same manner. It's amazing to watch it happen. Talk about what the experiments will be that you're in charge of or things that you'll be doing on board. Wow, there's hundreds of experiments, but uh, some of the ones I'm probably most interested in since I'm a physician are the ones where we are looking at changes that occur to the human body. Um, one of the biggest ones that we're doing in conjunction with the Russians is an experiment called fluid shifts. Last question, thank you. And what fluid shifts Last looks question, at you. is, um, you know, when folks get up into the microgravity environment on board the space station, they do have this massive headward fluid shift. And some folks think that that fluid shift can impact the structure of the eye and maybe even cause vision changes. And we're seeing these vision changes in astronauts uh, on board the space station. And so we're trying to make it a little more clear as to what those changes are, what exactly the fluid is doing. And so this is a big experiment that we're gonna be performing throughout the entire length of our six months on board ISS. Well, we're beyond excited to watch you go up and congratulations and have a great time. Hopefully we'll get to talk to you on board. Absolutely, thank you so much. Hi, Serena. Hello, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. How about me? Good, thank you. Yes, perfect. Let me try with my anchor. Hey, Serena, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How Hello, about me? Hello, this is Osvaldo. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
Awesome. I can hear you loud and clear, so I think we're ready. Great. Amazing. Okay, so we're going to start in about three seconds. Three, two, one. Hi, Serena. Thank you for joining us. First, tell us, how do you feel about to be on your way to the ISS? You know, it's, it's pretty exciting right now. Our, our crew just finished their final exams last week. And, and what I mean by final exams is we had one test on the Russian segment of the International Space Station and then an even longer exam on the Soyuz vehicle, which is the vehicle that takes us to and from the space station. And I'll be flying in that vehicle with Alex Gers from Germany and our commander of the vehicle, Sergei Prokopiev, here from Russia. And we went through a very long day of exams where they throw a whole bunch of malfunctions at you and watch the crew operate together to perform safely. But it was a very successful day. We actually got a perfect score. And so this week is nice because we are in our rest week and able to spend time with our families uh, prior to leaving for the Baikonur Cosmodrome in just a few days. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. But actually, do you have to speak German or Russian while you're on, on the space? So on board the Soyuz spacecraft, we primarily use Russian. Um, the Soyuz vehicle is a Russian vehicle. All of our flight data files or the instructions that we use are in Russian. And so when you listen to astronauts and cosmonauts from multiple nations, whether they're from Japan, the United States, Germany, or Canada, all of us will speak Russian on board that spacecraft. Once we get up to the International Space Station, the pri primary language we do use is English, but you'll often hear us speaking in Russian to our Russian colleagues. And it's very interesting. If you get the, our crew together, a lot of times the cosmonauts will speak to us in English and we'll return the response in Russian. So it's, it's just a mix. And some people can't understand a word we're saying half the time. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Now, how do you prepare for this unique trip? So preparation for a mission is usually about two to two and a half years long because you have to make sure that you are proficient in all of the systems on board the space station, including things like the electrical power system, thermal control. Uh, you have to practice doing spacewalks in our big uh, neutral buoyancy lab, which is the big pool that we have to practice spacewalks in, as well as uh, robotics training and then Finally, and very importantly, all the science experiments, and there are so many hundreds going on on board the space station. And those experiments can involve the human body, or in fact, we are the test subjects, uh, material science, engineering test demonstrations. So a lot of the education we receive is regarding those experiments. Now, are you going to perform a specific role on the ISS? Interestingly, no. So all of the astronauts, when they go through their training, we are all trained equally across the board, not only in spacewalks, uh, in robotics, all the space station systems. Now, that being said, I am one of the crew medical officers. And so there isn't a physician on board every mission to the space station. But since I am one and I'll be with my crew, if something medical were to occur, um, then I'd be the first person they talk to on the orbit. Now, some people think you solve all the medical problems. That's not what happens. We have flight surgeons on the ground that help support us from every nation. And so certainly we'd be receiving a lot of assistance from folks in mission control. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Serena. Have a good one. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for your questions. You're watching the Fox...
need to score the perfect home. So call American Financing. At Hi, Serena. This is Denver. Can I get a mic check, please? Yeah, I guess you love it clear, huh? Mattress me. Kingdom's 40% off Memorial Day blowouts going on now. 40% off that. I got you. You're good. Thanks. G, G, E, Whirlpool, and more. 40% off. Appliance Factory's Memorial Day blowout guaranteed to crush Lowe's and Home Depot. This is Fox 31 News. Back, everyone. You know we're huge on space here along the Front Range. We got a lot of local companies that deal directly with aerospace. But how about this? An astronaut who grew up in our area getting ready for her first space flight. The mission going to involve a number of experiments in biology, biotechnology, physical science, and of course Earth science too. So join us this morning. A very special guest. This is astronaut Serena on and Chancellor, and she is from originally Fort Collins. And you're going to the International Space Station soon, aren't you? Yep, actually, we're in our rest week right now. Our crews just finished our final exams, and in a few days, we'll leave for the Baikonur Cosmodrome to get ready to launch on June 6th. So, yeah, you're in Star City right now. You're going out to the Cosmodrome here in just a little bit. Have you always wanted to be an astronaut, or did you just kind of get pulled to it as you got further in your career? No, honestly, since I was a little girl, about five or six years old, I wanted to be an astronaut. As I went through elementary school, I remember watching shuttle launches over and over and over. And finally, my parents, I think they saw that and sat down with me and said, do you want to work for NASA someday? And I said, absolutely. I just don't know how to get there. <laughs> Well, you, you certainly found a way to get there. You've got a doctorate. You've got a mechanical engineering, I think, degree, too. Uh, amazing to see the STEM work that you've been doing. Uh, now, the shuttle program is over, and you're on the ISS. Are you trying to gear yourself towards Mars missions in the future? Or what are your future plans after the ISS? Well, certainly after the ISS, we'll, we'll see what comes along. We, our agencies have a lot of work to do. Um, to get towards Mars, and part of that could be going to the moon. Of course, Vice President Pence talked about that not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think in order for us to get to Mars, we have got to prove that we can sustainably and reliably live um, perhaps on another planet like the moon before going to someplace much further. A lot of what we do in the ISS is proving that technology right now. Even something as simple as the toilet that we use, is this a piece of engineering equipment that we could take with us towards Mars? <laughs> you know, we grow lettuce leaves, we re reclaim water. It's really an amazing place to live. Oh, thank you very much. We can't wait to see the work you're doing up there. And I promise you, you're going to be bugged by me, or at least the NASA people will, once you get on station. I know you guys do media interviews, so we're going to try and lock you down again. Really proud of you, Serena. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll talk to you All a little right. bit later. Best of luck. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. This beach, though. Panama City Beach. This area swells big time as we get into Memorial Day weekend. Not this weekend, but the weekend after that. Uh, some 41.5 million of you, believe it or not, will be traveling for this unofficial kickoff in <coughs> summer. The good news is we're getting this tropical wannabe thing out of the way. NHC dropping the percentage is developing to about 10% now. Most people, though, when they come to the beach, they want the sunshine. It's going to be a couple of days. I think we'll get, get that to back there, at least along the Emerald Coast. We'll be right back. I did. I sent an inter I sent that email saying. Yeah. Very good. Somebody will uh, be in touch with you in just a moment. Kate will laugh at me because she makes fun of me for watching the other channel. So do you. <laughs>
Imagine waking up in a hospital with a fractured skull and a brain injury. Imagine insurance refusing to pay for your care, even though the trucker caused... Brooke, can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you loud and clear. Help me. Oh, great. Thank you. You bet. We hear you great. All right. So your launch is scheduled for June 6th. Talk us through the process that you're about to go through over the next few weeks. So actually right now, our, a few days ago, our crew just finished our final exams in Russia. And um, that included an exam on the Russian segment of the International Space Station and also the Soyuz vehicle, which is the vehicle that takes all three of us to and from the space station. And that's myself, Alex Gers from Germany, and our commander of the Soyuz vehicle, Sergei Prokopiev, here from Russia. Uh, we get a few days of rest right now, and then on May 19th, we head down to the Baikonur Cosmodrome and start the final uh, last few weeks of preparations towards launch. All right, and you're a physician. What question a lot of people have is, can you catch a cold in space? Is seven so, no, that's I'm actually a great... Out. That's a great question, and that's one of the reasons why they keep our crew in quarantine, a medical quarantine, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome for about two to three weeks prior to us even launching, and that's to eliminate the possibility of any virus getting up with us on board the vehicle. And so we have physicians down there with us and making sure our hands are clean all the time and everything is in a very sterile environment. And then once we launch the station, um, hopefully there'll be almost a zero chance of you catching anything while you're up there. So we're pretty safe. And there are hundreds of experiments on board ISS. Which are you most looking forward to working on? The spot for high um, wind. So interestingly, one of the ones I'm looking forward to, and there are so many that impact the human body, one is from the Canadian Space Agency called T-Bone. And T-Bone is going to look at the internal structure of our bones. We've got many people on Earth that suffer from something called osteoporosis. So almost everyone you know knows somebody with this disease. And astronauts get a similar type of bone loss while in orbit. It's called a disuse osteoporosis. Sometimes, though, our regular scans, the DEXA scan or bone scan that people use to pick that up, doesn't do a good enough job looking at that internal structure of the bone. And so what this particular experiment is going to look at is really how that network of bone and bone cells changes during our six-month mission. And is that similar to what we see on Earth in folks with osteoporosis? This is just thunderstorms. The ratio is big, right? It's very wide, a huge cluster of thunderstorms. That study, I would think, would have implications for deep space travel too, right? And what's Absolutely, because depending on how long your mission is, um, you know, you try and mitigate that bone loss as much as you can. We've done a pretty good job with our six-month stays here on ISS. Of course, if you're taking a much longer trip to Mars, you know, what are the implications of that? Do we change the type of exercise that we use? Do we consider using medicines to help treat the osteoporosis that astronauts see, similar to what we use on Earth? Shower. Last question. What for you was the most grueling part of your training? From Boston uh, all the way down. The most grueling part of the training is probably the training that we do in NASA's big neutral buoyancy laboratory, which is our really big pool where we practice spacewalks. And it's a very long day. You're in the suit for up to eight hours, um, certainly underwater for six hours, learning how to repair things on board the space station. Um, you get a little bit of water, so you really have to mitigate how much water you drink during that run, but it's physically one of the most demanding training tasks that we perform, but also very satisfying when you complete a run every time. Serena, thank you so much. Best of luck with the launch. Uh, Lane County, we have- Thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, I'm on then. Hello, Joe. Hi there, Dr. Anon. I'm sorry, am I pronouncing that correctly? No, you're fine. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, thanks for making time for us this morning. We're here in your home state of Colorado, right for the Denver Post. Um, yeah, I was able to pick up some of what you were just talking to on your last interview. Um, so explain to me, uh, you're the deputy crew surgeon for this mission? No, so actually the crew surgeons are the folks that are on the ground supporting the astronauts and so they serve as the physicians for the astronauts. So when you're in the astronaut corps and you get assigned to a space flight, we're each trained equally across the board to perform tasks on board the space station. Um, because I am an MD, then one of the additional tasks that I'm assigned while our crew is on orbit 
is as one of the crew medical officers. So if we did have any sort of a medical problem during the expedition, then certainly my crew members would come to me for help. We don't always fly a physician on our expeditions. And so sometimes those crew medical officers are test pilots or engineers, and they train those folks up to a basic kind of EMT level to help handle medical events that might hurt, happen on the space station. But we have a great surgeon, a lead crew surgeon and deputy crew surgeon that support us and our families on the ground and follow us not only way before as training starts, but throughout the entire space flight and after we land. Right. And you've done that for one mission for the ISS? Is that accurate? Yeah, so I, I was a crew surgeon from 2006 to 2009 and had the pleasure of being the deputy surgeon for a shuttle mission, SDS-127, and also did support uh, a partial expedition mission during that time, but then had to give up those duties as I went to begin training in the actual astronaut corps. Right. Yeah, and quick referencing your bio on the NASA page, is this your first time going up to the ISS, Serena? Yeah, yes, it is. It's the first time. And obviously you train extensively years and years of training, but you know, what can you say about how you're feeling in advance of this mission? Well, obviously you're pretty excited. It's, it's, you know, like I said, my crew just finished final exams in Russia and that was a big thing that we had ahead of us. And so it was, it was a big relief to get those over with and know that we did well. And right now we're just enjoying the time with our families, but in a sense, our mind is always already fast forwarding to when we get to Baikonur, Kazakhstan, where the Cosmodrome is and prepping for those final phases of launch. Little things that you still need to take care of and you almost begin to get your game face on. And I think that's different for everyone, but everybody starts to focus in um, pretty quickly. Right. When is the launch date itself? I know that May 19th you begin final preparation. That's right, May 19th we fly down to Baikonur and currently the launch is scheduled for June 6th. So what do you have to check off in those final weeks before that June 6th launch date? So many of the things that we're doing is actually looking into at our real flight vehicle. All of the things we've been training on here in Star City are simulators in very high fidelity. But when we get to Baikonur Cosmodrome, that is actually our launch vehicle on the pad. So we do several fit checks in our spacesuits where we get inside and the vehicle has been loaded with all of the equipment. Um, everything we're used to using during the space flight. So a lot of that is getting in and doing systems checks and making sure we know where the placement is, where the placement is of everything inside that vehicle prior to launch. Right. And then, yeah, uh, you know, again, I overheard some of your talk about osteoporosis and bone uh, research, but what's going to be the focus of your time up there? You're going to spend six months in orbit um, what are you going to be looking at? What's uh, your primary research focus? So it's, it's interesting. There is no one area that I'll focus in in particular because of the hundreds of experiments that are going on. Uh, yes, certainly osteoporosis is one of them. Uh, there are other experiments looking at amyloid and the structure of amyloid in the brain, which, as we know, contributes to Alzheimer's disease. So that's one I'm really excited about. Fluid shifts, another one as well. So really we'll be looking at every aspect of the human body as much as we can, as well as uh, engineering and material science. Going to sleep?
pase a Rusia. Las instrucciones para obtener tu Fan ID son muy claras. Tienes que tener un Fan ID. Stand by. Si es el caso. ¿Cómo se saca el Fan ID? Pasaporte. El código del hotel. Y una foto con fondo. ¿Me Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. How Para puerta mi carta. Fan ID. Con tu Fan ID ingresas. Okay, thank you. Rusa. Y con tu Fan ID puedes ingresar al estadio junto con el boleto. Junto con el boleto. Quienes entraron a esta página de Fan ID y no lograron obtenerlo, están tramitando su visa y se van a ir a Rusia, como dicen, a ver si pega y si consiguen boletos. Lo cierto es que algunos no les interesa tanto ir al fútbol, sino como ir a la pachanga. Y obviamente, pues ahí vamos a estar, para ir a votarles todo el... Eh, eh, eh. ¿A poco no, mi querido Miguel Adita? Les vamos a traer todos los detalles de la pachanga. Solamente nos falta un mes, ¿eh? Sin duda, mi Sin querida duda. Cari, muchísimas querida gracias por la información. Salan, faltan solo 30 días. Miguel, como bien dije, tú estuviste uh, sí. ahí en la Copa FIFA Confederaciones y tuviste la oportunidad de saber que hay que tomar, además de esas medidas que ella dijo, unas más. Sí, lo, lo más recomendable es ir con una agencia de viajes que uh -huh. te provea el transporte, el boleto al estadio. Hoy es muy difícil entrar con un boleto en reventa a un estadio y además se exponen a las reglas locales que son rígidas del país. Lo recomendable es, repito, ir en orden. Me, me comentabas que eh, ese Fan ID tiene una foto, si no coincide sí, con el nombre que está en el boleto, no entras de, de todos modos, aun cuando tengas las dos cosas. Y puedes estar cometiendo un delito, además. Uy, 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 uy así que mejor hacer las cosas como mandan. Correcto. <risa> gracias, mi querido Miguel. Ahora vamos a pasar con Marco. Gracias, gracias, chicos. Tengo el honor de que nos vamos a enlazar vía satélite desde Star City, Rusia, con la astronauta cubano-americana Serena María Chancellor, a quien para ayudar esta entrevista por reglas de la tiene que ser en inglés, así que está haciendo la pregunta en español. Hi there, how are you doing? So glad to have you. Good, here. how are you doing? Gusto en tenerte con nosotros. I'm great, I'm great. It's an honor talking to you. Es un honor hablar contigo. ¿Cómo te sientes? ¿Estás lista para viajar al espacio? Serena, how do you feel? Are you ready to travel to space? Yes, we're getting ready. Uh, our crew just passed our final exams last week on both the Russian segment of the International Space Station and our Soyuz vehicle, which is the vehicle that takes us to and from the ISS. And we're in our rest week right now, spending time with our families. And we head to the Baikonur Cosmodrome very soon for the final weeks prior to launch. Wow, maravilloso. ¿Cómo wow, te enteraste maravilloso. que había sido seleccionada para participar en una misión que iría a la Estación Espacial Internacional? Well, you actually get called into the chief of the astronauts' office, and they say, we have a mission for you, and it's one of the best days of your life. Some people think we launch very soon after that, when in reality, we have another two to two and a half years of training on space station systems and spacewalks and how to use the robotic arm. And we spend a lot of that time in Russia, too, just as I am right now, on the Soyuz vehicle. So it takes a long time once we get assigned before we actually fly. Wow, qué maravilla. That's, that's amazing. Desde niña siempre nos contaron que ha soñado viajar al espacio, pero ¿qué ha sido lo más difícil de tu entrenamiento? We've learned that since you've been very young, you've always dreamt about going to space. But what has been the most difficult part of your training? Probably the most challenging part of our training is training in our big neutral buoyancy laboratory, the big spacewalk pool that we have where we put on the big white spacesuits that you see and practice for six to eight hours repairing parts on ISS, on the space station. Things do break and we need to go out and fix them. And physically, it's some of the most demanding training we'll, we'll ever do. Um, it's some of the most satisfying training to get through a run and know that you did that successfully. So, um, and I've had the chance to do that quite a bit with the folks that I'll be flying with on the space station. Wow, y estarás en órbita a unas 250 millas de la Tierra. De la tierra. Aparte de tu familia y tu esposo y tu hija, ¿qué piensas que es lo que más va a ser que más de estar en este planeta en la Tierra? You will be in orbit about 250 miles above the Earth for six months and besides your family, your husband, your, your daughter, what do you think is what you will miss the most about being here? 
So I think one of the things people miss the most is almost the smell of fresh grass, feeling the sun on your face, feeling the wind touch your face. And of course, certain foods. There are certain things that we don't get very often up there. And those are things like fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the few times we do get them, people say that when an orange comes up on a, a resupply vehicle, you can smell that orange all the way down the space station. Everybody knows it's there, so we all have to share. Wow, qué maravilla. Y, y qué disciplina. Mis respetos para lo que estás haciendo como mujer. All my respects to you as, as a woman, as a Latino woman, como una mujer latina. Felicidades. Eh, y también mi respeto por la disciplina para estar comiendo capsulitas o no sé qué lo que les den allá arriba. All my respects for your discipline to be eating capsules instead of actual food. So thank you so much. It's an honor meeting you, sending you all our, our love and admiration. Toda nuestra admiración y amor para ti. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, we are not receiving the uh, satellite feed at this point. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. This is uh, Jeff from Fox 21 News in Colorado Springs. Hello, Colorado. How are you? Hi. I am doing well. Um, one second here. All right. Um, we'll start off with uh, when did you realize being an astronaut was really, really a possibility for you uh, career-wise? Wow. So it, that, that's a great question, actually. I think, you know, a lot of folks dream and we take certain steps and progression of that dream. And honestly, you don't realize it until the day they call you and say you've been accepted into the astronaut corps because you don't know what's going to happen until that very moment itself. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a long process to try and get into the Corps. But what I tell folks is you've got to throw your hat in the ring. You've got to at least try if you think it's something you want to do. Nice. And um, can you describe the moment you realized you were actually going to become an astronaut? Um, I do remember getting the call, and I was waiting to have lunch with a good friend. Um, we missed that lunch that day because I ended up calling every member of my family instead to tell them that I had gotten the call from the astronaut office saying that I was in. And it's, it's really just a mixture of elation and really tremendous – it's an honor. It's an absolute honor to realize that you were chosen – um, certainly myself with eight other Americans that year, when there are so many qualified people, uh, you feel very lucky, uh, and you realize uh, there's a lot of work that we had ahead of us at that point. So um, we were ready for that, though, and just tremendously excited to get started. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, um, what, what's the hardest what, part of becoming an astronaut? Are there any mental or physical, or physical aspects to that? Certainly, uh, you know, and when I tell a lot of kids when I speak to schools is you definitely want to stay in as good a shape as you can, be as active as you can. Um, you know, don't sit in front of the computer all day long and playing video games and things like that. You know, try and get outside, be with your friends, be involved with sports, um, because that is really one of the only ways you keep your body healthy. And try and eat as healthy as you can. That's also one of the most difficult things, especially for kids nowadays when we live in this environment where all kinds of food is out there and you have to make good choices. So even for astronauts, we're constantly watching that. We stay active. We watch what we eat all the time to keep our bodies as healthy as we can before we travel into space. And uh, as a kid, is this something you grew up wanting to do to become an astronaut? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think probably from the age of five or six, I began thinking about it. And then I remember being in elementary school and watching shuttles launch over and over. And then that's finally when my parents kind of pulled me inside and said, you keep watching these shows over and over and over. Do you think you want to work for NASA someday? And, and they were tremendously supportive. My entire family's been supportive since that time. But yeah, it really did start at a very early age. That's great. That's great. Excuse me. Um, have you faced any uh, sort of discrimination on your journey, uh, being a woman or a uh, Hispanic? No, not at all, actually. Um, I haven't faced any of that. In fact, certainly NASA, the standards they set out for qualification in all areas, including space station systems, robotics, space walking, even physical fitness standards, are absolutely the same and equal across the board. So I have not experienced that. Everybody's expected to work as hard as everyone else, and that's why I absolutely love working there. It is all on you, um, and you can get there, and they have people to help you get there. Everybody has difficulty in, in one area. Nobody's immune to that. And so um, it's a lot of fun to be able to help each other out, and I think that's what we did. My class especially worked as a team uh, over those first two years of training. And um, being a child of an immigrant, has that impacted your worth, worth, work ethic in any way? Well, certainly my father and my mother and really my whole family, I, you know, I watched them work extremely hard um, all my life. So I had fantastic role models growing up, and my father worked very hard when he came to this country. And those lessons do stick with you, that in order to get where you want to be and to accomplish certain things, you need to put the work in. It's not talent. Talent is not enough. Brains are not enough. It's hard work that pushes people through and often perseverance. And um, one second here. Uh, what were you, what's, uh, what do you expect to feel like the first time you look down back on earth? You know, I, I'm not sure. And that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to. Uh, some of my friends have described it as the most human experience you can possibly have. And so once I know what that is, I will let you know. We're going to go to Bill Harwood. Hey, Serena, Bill Harwood. Hey, Serena, Bill Harwood. At the Kennedy Space Center. How are you today? Appreciate the time. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? Doing great. You know, I was just looking over your bio, and I, I read about a stint in Russia. You've lived and worked in Antarctica. You lived underwater in Aquarius on the Nemo Project. What's a little trip to space, right? I mean, it seems like a natural progression for you. Yeah, it's funny. NASA NASA actually does a really good job of using what we call analog environments, like Nemo, the Nemo mission, where we spend time underwater in Antarctica, to put us in these environments where, you know, the environment is harsh. And you know our training comes into play, and we learn what's important to us. We basically learn good self-care and good team care. What are the things that we need to do to make sure we succeed on that mission? And then also constantly monitoring our teammates to make sure they're successful on the mission. Yeah, you know, I think that in a, in a confined environment with a small group of people, that the interpersonal relationships would be a really uh, key aspect to being successful. Absolutely, though. Funny enough, the space station is as big as a five-bedroom house. And I've often heard that there are full days that go by where you will not see most of your crew the entire day because they're working in one section, you're working in another, and then you may catch each other at mealtime. So it's amazing to think that this, the size of the space station that we have up there right now can support this big family, and there's plenty of room. Tell me a little bit about your impressions of the Soyuz. It's not everybody that gets to strap themselves inside a rocket ship. So uh, what are you looking forward to, and, and what's your sense of the reliability, safety, all that? The Soyuz is a wonderfully robust and redundant vehicle, and I don't think you can truly get that sense until you go through the training that we have out here, where you learn about the different systems. Um, and the great thing is, you know, the Russians have been flying a very long time, just like we have, and we've been flying together for a very long time. And so it's they do a great job out here in Star City of preparing an international crew. So my crew is a German astronaut, myself, and a Russian cosmonaut to act in an operational environment and follow all the same rules and procedures to make sure that mission is successful. But absolutely, I have complete faith in the Soyuz. It is a wonderfully robust vehicle. What are you looking forward to the most? You know, every astronaut says, you know, looking out the window. But, but with somebody with your list of accomplishments, I'm just curious what the, what the drive is for you. 
I think one of the, the two things I'm looking forward to, one is to see how my body reacts in a microgravity environment because you hear all the stories. I used to be a flight surgeon where I would monitor their stories and now I'd like to know what my story is going to be. And then really that second part, because often many folks have talked about it, is looking down on the earth to see how that impacts you and what sort of perspective you gain. I think until you're up there, it is just indescribable. And But I'm looking forward to creating that story and then being able to tell that story. Hey, thanks, Serena. They're telling me I got to go. So I apologize for the short interview. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Hi, Serena. Thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. Um, it is uh, an honor to be speaking with you, and uh, I'm looking forward to your trip to space. Are you looking forward uh, to going to space for the first time? Hi, good morning. Yeah, absolutely good to be with you. And yes, very much looking forward to it. Uh, our crew just finished our final exams. Uh, just a few days ago on both the Russian segment of the ISS and then also the Soyuz spacecraft. And right now we're in our rest week where we spend time with our families prior to departing to Baikonur in preparations for a June 6 launch. Great. Um, so hey, um, you were originally so scheduled were originally to go to space a bit later with Expedition 58 and 59, and then you were switched to Expedition 56 and 57. Uh, just a few months ago. So how has that kind of affected your training or your plans for, for uh, going to space? So actually it was a really smooth transition, uh, mostly because the crew that I moved to um, and that change you know, occurred a little earlier this year, uh, I knew very well. I've known Alex Gers for a very long time. He was selected uh, into ESA at the same year that I was. And Sergei Prokopiev, our Russian uh, commander on board the Soyuz, I've also known him for a while because I had been training in Star City and, and we're kind of like one big family out here. So those guys made it uh, very, very easy to slide right into that crew. 
And, you know, schedules were a little bit packed at first, but everything ended up working out beautifully, uh, both the training on the U.S. side and the Russian side. And we are definitely ready to head down to Baikonur. Great. And have you done any kind of special training for the arrival of commercial crew vehicles sometime in the future? We do a lot of special training for that, and most of that involves uh, our robotics training um, because the commercial crew vehicles don't come up and, and, in a sense, park themselves on the space station. They go up and, and, in a sense, hover a certain distance from the space station, and we take the robot arm out and we grab that commercial crew vehicle and bring it in. And so it's some of the most challenging training that we do. It's very rewarding. We all love it. And since we have so many commercial crew vehicles coming up there to visit us during our stay, we're really excited because that means it's going to be a really busy six months. And do you have plans to do any spacewalks while you're up there? Uh, we don't know yet. It depends on... Uh, what spacewalks will eventually be scheduled, and our, our mission management teams at Houston are always taking a look and planning those ahead. So we'll find out at some point, but probably while we're on orbit. Great. And um, So what are you most looking forward to, both in terms of just being in space and experiencing microgravity, but also in terms of the science that you'll be doing while you're on board? Yeah, so certainly at first I'm looking forward to see how my own body reacts in the microgravity environment because you hear a bunch of stories, but everybody's different. And, you know, also just really looking out the window the first time and, and taking a glance at our Earth, at our planet. Um, the great thing is also a lot of the experiments going on on board the space station, since I am a physician, do relate to human science and possible medical benefits on Earth. You know, we're looking at everything from internal bone structure, um, which can impact our astronauts, but also people with osteoporosis. Uh, to even the structure of amyloid, which is a protein, that a plaque that can form in people with Alzheimer's disease and, you know, that, are, that many people on this planet are stricken with. And so I'm really excited to conduct some of these experiments on board the space station because I know that it will help benefit our medical science on Earth. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Serena. I really appreciate it. And uh, have a safe trip for your first trip to space. Absolutely. Thank you so much.